And welcome back to another GAC podcast where we're going to be discussing games, anime, computers, and collectibles, but not necessarily all those in a week. I am still your host, Harrison, and to my left... Hi, I'm Faust. And to my right... Boss Pander. And we're going to talk about uh, whatever we found interesting or yeah. where we found this lovely game informer that just got, you know, <laughs> yeah, delivered. Oh dear. Yeah. That, that hasn't been here long enough to have found anything in it. <laughs> I found Assassin's Creed Origins on the cover. <laughs> on the cover? <laughs> Still found something. Yeah, so, I, I know we, we put up the last episode and called it uh, E3 Coverage 2017 Part 1. Right. Um, this is Part 2, so we're going to talk about something from E3, but unfortunately, what from E3? Oh, is, God. It, yeah. was, it was horrible this year. Mm-hmm. It was... Either, either, either we're, we're getting out of touch or the game industry is getting out of touch because nothing really pulled my interest. And everybody else is going off about stuff like Anthem and uh, Origins, Assassin's Creed Origins. And, I mean, just... <sighs> Nintendo was the winner. Nintendo was definitely the winner. Along with Digital Devolver. Yes, definitely. Digital Devolver gets so many honorable mentions, if not, like, Razzie Awards for that <laughs> that presentation. They, like, lampooned the entire, you know, thing about yeah. E3. which. I mean, I'd, I'd expect no less from Devolver Digital. I think they did an awesome job. Yeah. Yeah. But overall, it's just the announcements are all kind of like blasé. They had problems with using YouTube personalities for announcements. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the YouTube coverage was kind of boring because they kept cutting back to these idiots that I don't, I don't know. And they're going, they're, they're basically just mirroring whatever the comment section is mirroring. It's like, get back to the live stream. Yeah. You know, it was like, show me E3. Don't show me you enjoying E3. That just makes me jealous. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they just didn't do too good with it. But it looks like the biggest things on the pile that are being talked about mm-hmm. out of E3 are uh, Nintendo is making two Metroid games. This has overshadowed everything. Yeah. Because they're doing a side-scrolling 3DS game, and they are... Doing uh, Metroid Prime Four also, which are the two strongest en- types of uh, Metroid games there are. Metroid Prime was definitely the best possible translation of a two D platformer to a three D exploration game. Yeah, um, I still play Prime on my Wii every now and then. And then Prime uh, Metroid itself started as a two D game. Uh, Super Metroid made it the quintessential 2D Explorer game. It was was one half of the ever pre- ever present Metroidvania style of gameplay. So making one for the 3DS is just a no brainer. You need to do that. Yes, it it needs to happen that way. Well, besides that, and all the Nintendo fans going ha, and the Nintendo Switch still being sold out everywhere. Like yeah, whoa, eight That's months crazy. in. Yeah, I mean MSRP is two ninety nine. Online, like on Amazon, straight from Nintendo as a seller, it's still going for like four hundred and thirty dollars. Yeah, that's, like that's they insane. they are playing the market. They're using that amiibo knowledge and playing the market hard. Yeah. Um. So a little sneaky. Like, okay, we'll give this one to you, Nintendo. But come on, everybody wants your console. You make them, and you I mean you can sell them faster than you can make them at this point. Yeah. I think uh, other than that, next one on the list. We're going to talk about Xbox, but I don't think that was the number two mm, biggest announcement. Not really. Um, was probably Bioware's Anthem. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. You know, jetpacks and spacesuits and flying around some open world prettiness. Yeah. It's, yeah. If I could do that for real, I'd be interested. Yeah. As I, as I <laughs> told a friend on Facebook um, when they said that they were really excited for it, it's like, I'm fine. The only thing that makes me really reluctant is seeing Bioware's name on it. Yeah. Because Bioware does really great stories, and when they stay focused in on something, they do a really great job. Unfortunately, none of their games that I have played have remained focused for very long. Well, they screwed the pooch with, like, in the long term yeah. on Mass Effect. Mm-hmm. They screwed the, po- the pooch long term with Dragon Age. Um, they need to get a chance to screw the pooch with Knights of the Old Republic, hence why it's still held up actually the first Knights of the Old Republic still holds up people say that Knights of the Old Republic 2 was probably uh, a bad a mishandling of it 
is not exactly it's still it's still more Knights of the Old Republic. It's still it's still the same game that people know and love, but the story is going to leave you, is going to let you down, which is weird for a BioWare game. Um, typically, what it is in my mind is that the gameplay just doesn't evolve in yeah. any of their games. No, and um, that it's usually the samey stuff and just wandering around with a cadre of people. So all you hear is just you know thirteen different sets of footsteps. And you can get lost in dialogue tree after dialogue tree, sometimes spending on average about half an hour to 45 minutes just having dialogue before you can even get to whatever action sequence. And then it's the same action sequence you've had a million times over. And the only thing that breaks it up are these horribly implemented, badly designed mini games. Mm. Planet scanning, anyone? Oh, hey. <laughs> I remember planet scanning from StarCraft 2, but, you know. Yeah. That was something else. Uh, let's see here. We had Ubisoft bringing back uh, Beyond Good and Evil. I'm excited for this. That's been like over a decade. Mm-hmm. And but I mean, nothing about that. <laughs> uh, Beyond Good and Evil is a third-person platformer stealth 'em up uh, kind of thing. It's got a brawler thing to it. It's just got a really good story. They built this really great world. Um, it was one of the earlier um, unique attempts by Ubisoft to try and start a new IP. Yeah, and it had a sequel hook. When the, 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 the first game had a sequel hook that they were supposed to tie into. Yeah. And I don't know if they're going to be tying into it with this game. They probably will. It's just, it, it, it took a while because it was like a cult following. Mm-hmm. It just took time, or just like Psychonauts. Yeah, but they needed to prove that there was an audience for this. Just yeah. like they needed to prove there was an audience for Psychonauts. And Psychonauts is still getting some other stuff, though we didn't really hear anything through E3 oh. about that. No. No, I mean, we heard some rumblings in first quarter of this year. Yeah. And then nothing. So we'll see. We'll see. Maybe there's some new Psychonauts on the way as well. But Beyond Good and Evil 2, I'm excited for this. I want to see this. I think the uh, the biggest surprise was uh, basically Pokemons coming to the PC. So, <laughs> And I know I'm going to get land blasted for that. But come on, guys. Monster Hunter is Pokemon. And so it's going to be on consoles and PC. Well, to be fair, I mean, yes, it is Pokemon in that you have to go and, and hunt all of the monsters. But you're hunting the monsters. You hit them with swords and blow them up with dynamite. And you craft armor out of their skins. You don't do that with Pokemon. Okay. Are you sure? No. I, I mean, I would play Pokemon well, if you did that. Think, what What do you do during Pokemon Go? You have to sacrifice other Pokemon to get other Pokemon eggs. Hey, you're sending no, it. No, no, you don't sacrifice to get the Pokemon. But you're sending them. Well, to, sometimes you you. I mean, you do have to get rid of some. Sometimes you're sending them to the professor. Yeah, I mean, who knows for what medicinal he's doing research. with I mean, them. you know, Pokemon research. <laughs> so monster hunters. And he sends you candy. Yeah. 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 He doesn't send you armor or a flashy sword or anything like that. Who knows what he's doing with the Pokemon, but... <laughs> so, um, and so... In uh, place of the Xbox One, I mean, we still have to get Shadows of Colossus. We still have to get through that. I'm going to get to that um, with my next bit, but you but go right ahead. The other one, beca- because... Uh, was EA's co-op Prison Break game a way out? Uh huh. This, which just sounds like Escape Room, the game. Yeah, but this seems like an interesting premise. You know, it's an interesting premise, and I'm just hoping they don't handle it like it's been like the way it's been handled a million times before. I mean, an Escape the Room game is something that has been made in Newgrounds Flash games and you know small small engine games before that. I specifically remember playing a, an Escape the Room kind of game on Commodore 64 or on. Commodore, yeah, one of the Commodores. It may be yeah. slightly like this, but it's at least yeah. made by the people that did Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons. Uh, wonky Controls, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, And it's a co-op narrative. So good to, to bring in co-op and giving it something other than just a bunch of people banding together to shoot at things. Yeah. I, I am down for this. I, I'm willing to keep an eye on it and say this is something to, to really look forward to just because it's something original. It, really. At least it it'll is. be some more content on YouTube. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Really not sure if any of the games are original anymore. <laughs> well, that that's my point. Really, you can only go so far. But General Jousting <sighs> is that original? <laughs> no, guys have been doing that in the showers forever, dude. <laughs> don't don't drop the soap. Don't drop the soap. <laughs> um, but my my point exactly is, what year is it? I mean, you know, they announced Shadow of the Colossus. <laughs> Apparently, Atari is coming out with a new console. Bubsy is getting made again. Yeah. A- Accolade is behind Bubsy, not sold it. I want to see. It. I want to see the Atari. Yeah, yeah the that, Atari. Um, what I remember from childhood. Yes, I'm aging myself. So it's got the wood grain. 
It will have the wood grain on it. <laughs> it will have a glowing Atari symbol. They say that it is based off of PC gaming specs. Oh, so it's an Xbox One X. It's going to but, be a it's going to be a modern gaming console. But it's not going to have the cartridges that you go. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, they might be able to work in an emulator or something like that. Like there, are, there is. You gotta a, blow them. There is a retro Atari box. There is a retro Atari console coming out right now. There, there have been a retro Atari consoles. The the blow in the cartridge thing didn't really come around until Nintendo. I thought. Is that something you did with with Atari? <laughs> Not as much as as Nintendo, mm. because the Atari had a better design. Yes, yeah, but true. you still did it some. The Atari it was more like pull it out, slam it back into the hole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the, the Atari that's, felt lethal. That's what she said. <laughs> yeah. uh, the the Atari, the original Atari, twenty six hundreds in them, they felt lethal. They were they didn't really feel cheaply made or anything like that. Like it felt like something that you could like pick up and smash over your sibling's head for winning too much, <laughs> and you know do some serious damage with it. Yep. Um, and that's been a pretty much a, a design choice for consoles all the way up until now, as these you know these are big heavy bricks of machines. And I'm hoping this new Atari console, uh, the Atari Box, is what they're calling it. We're ho hopefully we'll be getting some more information about that in the future. I've signed up for their mailing list and sent them a media contact, so we'll see what they say. I wonder what it is. Yeah, me too. Mm. They, they but uh, right now they've they've been very hush hush. They released a teaser trailer. And haven't really said too much else beyond that. Well, um, speaking of wondering, mm -hmm. there's actually another hardware thing that's been kind of super secretly talked about at E3, but nothing shown or whatnot, called Wonder. Mm -hmm. And they've mm. launched, launched an alpha program sign up and whatnot. And all we know is that there's some insanely big people in the field behind making this hardware, whatever it is. And... The things they're asking is, do you game on your mobile? What uh, what age group are you in? You know, and they have the pictures of it. And I had to choose Nintendo. Mm -hmm. um, and they ask about virtual. Uh, what virtual things VR have you used? stuff, yeah. Yeah, phones, PCs, and whatnot. And they had a category for other. And so I made sure I typed in there. I go, virtual boy. Oh. Because <laughs> I've used it, and it technically it was virtual. Technically, no, it was 3D. It was a really bad 3D too. It's, but I get the joke. Yeah, you get. Yeah, it's okay. a virtual boy. Exactly. Even if you just like put virtual in quotes and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's a, but it was a you know stereoscopic eye thing, just mm -hmm. like you know trying to do it on your phone. You know, with any of those, is basically the same thing. It's really bad. You yeah. Know? So do we know anything about Wonder, what Wonder is, or what no. it's going to be? We don't hear anything. It is insanely tight-lipped. Hmm. All it is, and we we don't even know how much backing there is behind it, but it's like... Well, it's, they seem to have enough to make a decent website. Well, that doesn't take much nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wonder. Oh, well, yeah. What the wonder. I, I just... There's going to be so many be. jokes around it. Yeah. I mean... They're, they could go up there, they could lampoon the entire, uh, it, when they reveal it, they could so reveal it just like Steve Jobs does any new Apple technology, but instead of saying it's magical, mm -hmm. say it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Uh, so it's, I don't know. I mean, this, this, this whole thing kind of smacks of... We could sit there and speculate and speculate and speculate, but since we have nothing to go on, we'll just sit there and, and express our wildest like I, desires and fantasies when it comes to like online gaming or platform gaming or anything like that. And maybe it's a hollow deck. Yeah, maybe it's a hollow deck. Like that, that, that's it. I'm putting my money down. Ooh. It's a hollow deck. I want yeah. a hollow deck. That way, I know I am just guaranteed disappointment. It's not. It, there's no possible way. Well, it it'll, could be. It could be like a shed, you know, that you put up in the yard, or like you know, one of those greenhouse or shed or something. You know, you get it from the store. You put like it a, up. And, like a pod. Uh, like one some, those, something. One of those portable storage things. You just order it and they just bring you a cube. Sit it down in your yep. front yard. It's like there's your holodeck. Yeah. You know, well, okay. Keep it clean. Yeah. So, I, I'm. I'm gonna make this just. I'm going to make this uh, correlation uh, in regards to Wonder. Mm -hmm. Even though there's all this hype behind it, everything else like this, and it has a lot of street cred for the people that are back behind it and everything, we know nothing. And with all this new hardware consoles being announced right now, I want, I, part of me goes, is this another Vaporware? Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Uh, remember the Phantom Entertainment? 
No. Okay, Phantom Entertainment was a company that was founded in 2002 by Tim Roberts, uh, who makes uh, computer keyboards. It was the Phantom. It was a Phantom video game console, and it was advertised on the internet, going on demand in oh, 2004. See. It was one of those things that basically tried to be a front end for like your game tap kind of thing, where you you bought the console and that gave you access to the games that they provided on a service. Yeah, it was, but it never so got basically, released. Basically, basically what PS Plus and Xbox Live. Yeah, the, are they sh- right they now. showed something for it. It was like a media center console and internet TV. Well, and- people who ordered the Ouya still got an Ouya. They just sad that they got an Ouya. That's all. But at least it was—it wasn't vaporware. Yeah, I mean that's like anybody buying an Xbox One X. They're gonna be sad if they bought an Xbox One X because <laughs> it doesn't exist yet. No, it's because yeah. it's gonna cost five hundred dollars when it comes out. So they're gonna have buyer's remorse. I mean that's understandable, especially for something like a system. What's the, the way point? That... I mean, is it really going to be any better? That that's the ongoing debate at this point. Like the current argument is the Xbox One X with the specs that they have been announcing is going to be an upgrade to the usual Xbox One or Xbox One S. That it is going to be 4K capable. It's going to be capable of playing the games that are released still better. But they are not yet announcing games specifically for the Xbox One X. They are not announcing games specifically for the Xbox One S. Actually, they've announced one for the Xbox One X. Yeah. Minecraft in 4K. <laughs> in 4K. Ugh. Guys. What? Uh, what the hell? So. Because I the, want like 10 different four to $500 consoles yeah. just sitting in my living room so I could have five games for each and every one of them. Yep. That's basically <laughs> how that works. And so... It's, it's another one of those things where it's like, okay, well, if you have a 4K display, you'll want to get a 4K capable thing, something that plays games. But I think the big thing that's going to make it popular is that it's going to be a 4K capable movie player, mm-hmm. capable of playing what's now known as the Ultra HD or the Ultra Blu-ray. Ultra Blu-rays. Ultra discs, whatever they're called. <laughs> but they're 4K really? movies. Yeah. They're called Ultra. Um, well, it's called the, Ultra HD anyways. Yeah. That's 4K. So essentially... That's the only thing that's really good that they're really kind of banking on at this point that I've heard. There's not going to create a whole line of games that people can't play. And the games that do release, they're going to have to release all across all of these platforms. So essentially, I think they're flooding their market. They're spreading themselves a little too thin because now they got the one, they got the S. I can see them fading out the one for just the S and the X. That, that, that's what I thought. No DVD player, no Blu-ray player. Yeah. Just put them in the pl- PlayStation. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, PlayStation, Sony, Sony had a great idea when they came out with Blu-ray. And then they made sure that the PS3 was the cheapest Blu-ray player on the market. Like, hands down. You could go, you could go yeah. get a PS3, and not only did it, pl- did it play Blu-rays, and was cheaper than any other Blu-ray player at the time. You play all your games. It played PS3 games. And they had the PS3, expo- <laughs> they had the Sony exclusives. So that was, that was smart. I don't know exactly what they're doing with the PS4 or the PS4 Pro, other than they're just trying to keep up with the whole 4K kind of thing, and the 4K player kind of thing. Well, here, here's the thing is... Um you know, the Xbox One X is coming on the market at $500. Mm-hmm. You already have the PlayStation 4 Pro City at $400. Yeah. Okay. You have, they put the PlayStation 4 at 250 during E3. Yeah. So as far as, uh, you know, price goes, as soon as the Xbox One X drops, you know, at $500, PlayStation 4 Pro can go, oh, look, 350 Yep. <laughs> Basically, this this is this is seeming like a bad idea across the board, especially because it's it's in my mind just forcing an upgrade cycle and trying to convince people that they need it's something that they need when they don't need it. But you're going to have your Xbox avatars for your dashboard redesigned so you can do, be more creative and show off your personality more with these. Have you seen this? Have we? I mean, because we made so much use of the Xbox avatars back in the day. This and is why I love my computer. Yeah. PC doesn't mess around. <laughs> like, you, you, you have the games, you play the games, that's it. You don't have to sign up for a service, yeah. you don't have to pay for anything. Well, you pay for your internet, well, but you I don't mean, have to pay for something beyond your internet. Update. You do have to do updates, but you don't have to redo everything every time there's an update. You don't have to get all new games every time there's an update. Yeah. I mean, you can, you know? you can, upgrade, your, you can upgrade your hardware and yeah. still play the games that you have. With a little finagling sometimes if they're really old games. You need to, like, an emulator or something like that. On top of that, if the game updates, you can do stuff while the game is updating. 
when you turn on when you put in a fresh game on into like an Xbox console or a Sony console these days, you have to sit there and watch a progress bar crawl for twenty minutes to to do the day the day zero updates. Ah, uh, yes. And you can't do those in the background. I mean, yeah, you can install, but once you go to the update, it's like, okay, I'm updating. It's like, great, might as well flip channel, you know, switch back to this other thing so I can actually do something with my time. This is why I bought a Steam Link, Mm -hmm. because at least the Steam Link is a $50 head to play across the network in my house. Yeah. My game console on the couch, essentially, (laughs) versus $500. Yeah, it's got to be a convenience thing. It's really does the does the equipment accomplish what you want it to do, and if it's the only thing you have access to, I mean, yeah, if you want four K, if you want to play four K movies and be ready for those games that are four K capable, if four K is that important to you, then an X is probably the way to go. If you have nothing else, if you've never picked up a console at all and this is your first one, the only the only advantage that a console typically has is it's crash proof, mm. it's driver failure proof, and a few other things. Uh, well, unless it's an Xbox. Unless it's an Xbox. We've, I mean, they've had their, every, everything's had their share of problems. But that's the perception. Yeah. You know? Is that you're, you're taking away a lot of the hassle there and they're having a lot done for you. But that could be a bad thing because then it's not going to be, sometimes it's not done the way you want it to be. I don't know. I, I, I'm always kind of flopping back and forth between this PC master race and the, the console generation because I was, I was firmly in both camps, really. Well, that's because we grew up in a time where. Yeah. There was no PC Master Race, mm-hmm. but there was a distinction between PC gaming and console gaming. Yeah, PC games tended to be see, more... See, not me. Not you? I, I didn't... I mean, there wasn't a lot of that PC gaming growing up. I had an Atari, and then I had like a Game Boy, and you know... Uh, the thing was... I got to sit there and play Sonic and stuff like that, the Game Gear and all. I had that kind of stuff. I didn't really have a computer. There was, like, when I got a little older and, like, junior high, I think we had one in our house. But I never actually owned one until my mid mid to late 20s. I never owned a computer. So, I mean, most of my gaming in my earlier years was console. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, there are a lot of consoles in the household, so there's still gaming on the consoles, but most of my gaming does happen on my computer or on my phone. I think, I think nowadays. <laughs> but the funny part is, I think most of the consoles in the house right now are collecting dust. <laughs> yes. pretty much. The, th- the thing about it is, like back in the day, there was a distinct separation between what you would play on a PC versus what you would play on a console. Right. Console games were more about reaction time and being able to, you know, jump at the right time, shoot at the right time figure out the puzzles you know simple simpler puzzles but puzzles nonetheless um pc games tended to be about more complex puzzles or things like emulating crosswords and stuff like that or they were very strategic they required resource management or some form of of uh, economic understanding or something like that i think there were some learning games like cookie crunch yeah there were learning games like like math blaster yeah (laughs) number munchers i mean there was there were there was for sure plenty of games to justify having it for all ages or being able to emulate those things that the consoles could do. But the consoles squarely occupied like the two D platformer market for the longest time and some of the top down shooting market and stuff like that. You didn't see these things get put onto PCs very readily. You know, my favorite PC game as a kid, yeah. um, Mario teaches typing. <laughs> it was actually quite a blast. Poor an uh, educational game. I think mine was King's Quest three. Or Laser Suit Larry. Chess like Master popcorn. 2000. Popcorn. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like Super Breakout. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I played Arkanoid back yeah. in the day. That was our family thing. All of us would pile up in our parents' room, the one computer in the house, mm-hmm. and play popcorn. Um, <laughs> I'd say I liked Dungeon Master 2 quite a bit. Not Dungeon Keeper, Dungeon Master. The one where the, the we had the... the quadrant based thing where you had like your character and then the arrows the directions to go and then a little readout and then you had the actual like game world i think i remember i, I yeah. think yeah but that's we're showing our age uh, <laughs> look just say it was fun i was young i had a lot of really great uh times with it but gaming has evolved and i we need to evolve along with it now mm-hmm. it's okay to not like the direction things are going because it's like we've been here before yeah and this is very obviously a forced upgrade cycle everything old is new again <laughs> yeah i mean they're, they're just taking everything that, that that sold even halfway well now and remaking it well uh, 
what what was it? It was a uh, CES like 1997 or something like that. Um, maybe it was 95. But mm-hmm. I showed I showed basically a 20 year old CES to you, and from uh, computer computing chron- chronicles or computer chronicles, mm-hmm. um, and you and when I and it's one of those things where I was watching. I'm like. Oh my God! Things have not changed in like twenty years, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this is pathetic. Well, I mean, what one of the things that they said is the reason we're seeing games the way they are now and movies the way they are now is technology has evolved to the point where we can present them adequately, that we can do the things that we couldn't normally do, and that we just had to give some sort of at, like representation of back in the day. So, like I said. Like I've said for the last two episodes, a lot of video games came out the way they were, were were because of the limitation of the console that they were designed for. Now we have actively consoles that are not limited in design space. I could see it with the games because the 8-bit, uh, you know, now it's you have a lot better with the graphics and stuff. Mm-hmm. The movies, they just need to stop doing it because there's other things. They can make movies. <laughs> It's true. probably going to be the same basis because there's just so many ideas you can come up with, but really, just make something else. <laughs> <laughs> Please, do something else. Yeah, that's something that's kind of crazy. It's just weird. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. What else is going on? Well, um, we have uh, Daily Motion planning to relaunch, focused more on uh, professional video programming. As opposed to whatever it is that they were doing before, which it seemed to be just kind of uh, a less uh, moderated, less rest- regulated uh, upload base of people uploading porn clips. Yeah, pretty well, much. Well, it got bought by Vin uh, Vinvetti, mm-hmm. so we're talking basically an actual TV station. You know, movie producers have bought this, so. Who knows what they're going to end up doing yeah. with it. Essentially, they were trying to be a competitor to YouTube, and that didn't really work to their advantage. A porn YouTube? Oh, no. Daily Motion. No, that's called RedTube. That's called RedTube or YouPorn or <laughs> PornTube or... PornHub. Any combination of YouTube and porn you can think of. Yeah. YouPornTube. <laughs> PornTube you. <laughs> it's probably out there. Yeah. I'm going to check that. But uh, <laughs> da- Daily Motion has kind of been... There, it's uh, yeah, it's a porn site. Nice. Uh, yeah. Now you're gonna have a worm. Meh, I'm pretty. I'm pretty safe. The uh, I dewormed my computer recently. But the thing is, it's like Daily Motion. I mean, their site layout's been kind of like blase. It's been like um, hasn't exactly attracted too much attention. Not even on the uh, European side where it's kind of used more. And they pushed was it? They pushed like gamers and let's players kind of out of daily yeah. motion anyways that was that was one of the big reasons why i stopped paying attention to them and they lost a lot of viewpoints is because daily motion seemed to be a better place to upload your videos and at least have them mirrored while you were doing uh, uploads to youtube with your let's plays um and then eventually they just kind of joined the likes of like vo and vid vidme and vimeo and vidler and well not vidme but not vidme um basically joining those ones that saying like the computer content like video game content it takes a lot to host it it doesn't pull in a lot of views really and they just felt like it wasn't really an adequate use of their platform so they outlawed it and they started taking them down which is a shame we lost a lot of really classic let's plays that way yeah then you have like vimeo yeah that uh is well what is it they ended up um they they went you have to pay for storage Mm -hmm. and they went creator creator friendly or full creator friendly full creator friendly you have to be a film student yeah like that's supposed to be a creative platform now so it's left a lot of um people struggling and in the dark that are just your average joe that says i want to be a youtuber when i grow up or hey i want to upload my uh, my my gameplay or i got a personal vlog where can i put this out and it's just been youtube but it's been my gosh, we've probably been talking about YouTube and all their full pause on and off for like half a year now. No, more than half a year. Probably. It's it started like it, shortly it, after we started it, making content with It came up and it went away for a little bit and it came back again. Now it's just here to stay. Um they haven't done anything new. They're still just doing the same horrible stuff they've been talking about doing. Yeah. So until we hear something new from them, we're not gonna really have much to mention. 
I think I think the worst parts about them right now are is the ad apocalypse is here to say, mm-hmm. and the fact that they've, um, you know, it's basically they reaffirmed we are going content uh, content family TV friendly. We are sterilizing this platform, so it's just been bad. And they said, you know, early what within a couple months ago that hey, we're going to have YouTube TV also and work with all these studios and everything, Mm -hmm. and we're going to get on our knees for the business executives. Here's here's subscriber content. So if you're a subscriber, you can see all this stuff without videos, but it's all curated, like, professional content. Yeah. You know, there's no... Like, they they brought in the biggest YouTuber they could find, of course, PewDiePie. Uh And then he goes and completely blows out and loses it. Essentially, well, he know. he got a hit piece against him mm-hmm. because of what because of his humor and everything. But it's just funny that all these top um, top YouTuber personalities are have been uh, even affected by by this. Mm-hmm. Well, that's because they're not family friendly. That's why they're so big because they're funny. They're more for you know. 20, 30 somethings, you know, these are the people laughing at them. This is the kind of people that are watching what they're doing. Yeah, these this are the eyes. Families watching them. Yeah, these are the eyes. These are the wallets. Yeah, these. Are, you know, if they want to do family them. friendly, they should have a separate little area of the channel where you click on or off that you just want family friendly content. That's called YouTube Kids. Yeah, I thought yeah. they had they had that and they made right. that they tried to make that a little more readily available and. I guess people started bitching because it was so easy to switch to kids mode and then they'd see stuff they didn't want to see because they aren't kids. Um, so now there, yes, there is YouTube well, kids. Then I believe they should still just click on only family, mo- just family, you know? You want just family content. It's, and then, you know, you turn that off if you want to see other stuff because the people that are really making YouTube are not those silly family content. Yeah, and that's the thing. That's is not what makes YouTube. People turned off traditional cable TV mm-hmm. and went to the internet because these were realistic. There was it felt more it real. Had it had heart. It had personality. Content. These were actual people that you could get invested in, not fake people like in the soap operas and everything. And they had people going off full on like you know hating the actors who played people in soap operas because of what they did in the soap mm-hmm. opera it's like this is all a story this is all mm-hmm. fake now you have things happening to real people in real life on youtube and it's it's real life you can't script that you can't make it up yeah it happens and it happens in some of the weirdest ways possible yeah but with all this i mean the interesting thing is is we got vice underneath their motherboard section actually wrote a article very recently like totally independent not even contacting vidme it appears and was talking about how vidme is the latest challenger to youtube's dominance Mm -hmm. and it goes on uh a big deal into the goods and the bads of it overall and evokes those such names as vo and vimeo and vidler yeah and daily motion and says these places these have tried before and it almost sounds like it's one of those things about mmos it's like will it be the big warcraft killer it's you know like come on the the way that you kill youtube is you don't try to kill youtube every time you say viddler Mm -hmm. i think of like a villain that's stealing the kit the cat's food yeah the vittles i got your viddlers i got your viddlers (laughs) um yeah viddler was a another youtube clone yeah. basically and it it the thing was the only thing that was really getting uploaded to it besides the the people trying to become content creators outside of youtube was let's play videos mm. and when they decided to get rid of let's play videos oops there goes like all of their content <laughs> and they didn't survive no yeah that's the interesting thing it's like yeah. there's it seems like you have uh game plays, you have drama and daily bloggers mm-hmm. it's like the vast majority of what people go look for and then you have like the artist you know but they an artist and animator can't put out every single day and then a separate kind of kind of niche is the reviews and critics um which i'm starting to learn is actually a pretty pretty interesting niche to kind of break into because we started with the unboxing videos and now we're doing movie reviews um we're doing game reviews occasionally with a separate tv thing yeah with media glitch media glitch so, I mean, being able to come and, and be analytical and be critical about something 
and have an informed opinion about it and have people support that is great. Mm -hmm. um, but that means that you you basically have to function with other critics and their views and everything like that. And when everybody when everybody agrees, it almost feels like you're being paid to agree. True. Which is far from the truth. <laughs> we don't get paid for any of our content. No. Uh, not yet. Not yet. I mean, there's the trickle, mm -hmm. but it's not like the big things like a big get, creator or anything like that. We get support from viewers like you. Um, yes. Which is awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for watching at all. If you if you do click that upvote, that follow, that mm. like. Yes. Tell us what you like and yeah. what you don't like. You know. I have some water. We're very <laughs> thirsty. Well, at least at least he is because he's out of water. Uh, I'm always out of water. Faust, Faust is out of water. You know, if you're not going to if you're not going to tip, you know, for for any of us, at least tip for for Boss Pander. You know, mm -hmm. the more tips we get on this episode, the more we'll try to get Boss Pander on camera. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it's like, I think Bid Me is, <coughs> has had the, the best chance of, of... a drinking problem? Yes. Yeah. Has had the best chance of making a difference uh, for newer, smaller <coughs> creators in the last year. Mm -hmm. And... Well, I think the, the major problem um, is that YouTube, this was the best analogy I heard by you, is YouTube is an ocean, whereas VidMe is an Olympic swimming pool. Yeah. You know, it's just it's a smaller, tighter community, which means that we all have to kind of get together and support each other so you do feel more of the camaraderie in a community yeah. that you don't get in YouTube because, I mean, the only time you ever see the same username is when you go to a channel that you subscribe to. Otherwise, in the comments and everything like that, I mean, no, but first, people have basically been taught not to pay attention to youtube comments at all yeah uh, because they've just been such toxic places that usually they get shut off for any any hot button topics i know at least of a couple of or uh, upvotes and downvotes get turned off too yeah it's like look i don't care if you like it or not like it this is my opinion this is my video watch it that's it mm -hmm. you know but i mean there, there are videos that are supposed to start a conversation and there are videos that are meant to entertain and there's a separation between all of that either way uh, I for completely forgot where I was going with all of this. You clean cup, move down. What's next? <laughs> wow. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so basically, VidMe is underneath the microscope now again mm -hmm. because there's been a public article on, on a relatively mainstream place, Vice, in re, uh, in regards to regards to oh, yeah. VidMe, and so it's going to be interesting to see if this causes more people to start looking at it and we know that in the last week there's been a couple of youtubers that have looked at it and they've said some uh they, they've had some opinions on it uh, and then there's been some other big youtubers that are actually directing traffic towards bid me right now which is great i mean yeah. anything that gets eyes into the community and gets people to sign up that's true if you if you come in just to kind of check it out and you end up on our video because a lot of our videos end up on the front uh, page and everything like that uh, definitely sign up I mean you know say what up we're perfectly friendly unless you say something worth trolling yeah uh, um, we think we're friendly I'd like to say we're friendly enough enough yeah but uh, uh, the I'm other thing I guess if since we're talking about changes in paradigm and everything like that the is, is that a, cat doing <laughs> he's thumping this yeah he's like <laughs> Flapping his foot against the like something's in his foot and he's itching it. Um, Rooster Teeth is in the news. Apparently, they're doing something to help out podcast creators specifically. Yes, um, they're trying to promote, uh, saying that the podcasts are a, a, a long ignored and under promoted uh, part of internet culture. That especially in the audio format, definitely. Like they, the people kind of see think if it's not if it's not a ten minute video, then it's not worth my time because it's either too long or it's not visually engaging enough or something like that. Yeah. So Rooster Teeth comes along and says that they, they found, you know, the, what they want to do is take podcasts, audio content that they know is um, worth listening to, and they want to facilitate hooking those people up with sponsors to yeah. help keep their show going and help promote their show even further. Yeah. And help, help them grow an audience. So uh, points to Rooster Teeth. I'm usually not one for saying that, but I think this is a really great idea. Well, yeah, they did this. They've done Rooster Teeth games and... I mean, with the podcast thing, it's like they technically run three, four podcasts. Mm -hmm. I mean, they they are in the business of knowing how to run a podcast. Yeah. Multiple podcasts, get sponsors every week. And I mean, they're not, you know, and, and basically negotiating with the sponsors for how the scripts are and everything like that. And 
overall, I mean, if anybody has the industry expertise to help people get sponsors, it's going to be... They it's have, going to be Rooster Teeth. They have a unique viewpoint because Rooster Teeth, as they are pretty common for saying, they have, they've been around before YouTube was a thing. They were around. Before, they were one of the people who started the initial like wave of content generation at all on Which the internet. Was like what two thousand and three, something like that. Yeah, like way way back when. They uh, were viral pre YouTube. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. they they have a unique viewpoint because they watched all that build up around them, and they were part of like the the uh, inception of all of that. So having having them say that this is something that they they realize is an untapped source is refreshing to tell you the truth because I've been podcasting for um, almost two years now, mm-hmm. and it's been a slow boil, if anything at all, trying to get those shows rec- recognized, get something like this out there, and and have people be like, I mean, you know, we don't see more than a minute thirty on our videos watched on YouTube. These things are an hour long. Yeah, it means nobody's watching these. Or at least of the views, nobody's finishing it. Well, typically. some some people mm-hmm. are. Some yeah. people are. You know. So, so. the people that click Thank on you. and off and actually listen to our full uh, our full podcast, you know, we do appreciate it. Yeah, you guys are awesome. Yes. And uh, if there's anything you want us to see change, you know, to help make maybe this format a little bit more engaging, you know, let us know, and we'll see what we can do because you know we're starting out. We're just amateurs. We don't yeah. know what we're doing. Yeah, we want to be able to make enough money to bid on Dark Helmet's Dark Helmet yes. from Spaceballs. <laughs> if you if you give us this money, we will make sure it's in the background of every video we do that has a live feed. Is it still for? Is, so is this still for sale? Can I'm wearing that thing. So the Spaceballs Dark Helmet, the original Dark Helmet, is for oh, sale. Dark Helmet, at, it's so big and shiny. Let's see, it's on mm. auction. It's up to fourteen thousand dollars after nine bids. Yeah, yikes! And so I say we pr- probably need more than fourteen. Probably closer to twenty. Sixteen, maybe. You yeah, know? This is the actual helmet that Rick Moranis wrote, what well, wore in Spaceballs. This is not a prop replica or anything like that. This is an on-screen film prop. Yeah, this is the actual factual thing if somebody wants to buy us that helmet <laughs> i will wear it the entire next year of podcasting every <laughs> single time <laughs> oh yeah we won't even have to force him yeah but i believe me that oh man i'll sit here and be like Faust, <laughs> i see your schwartz is as big as mine so yeah the uh but auction, you know how to use it <laughs> <laughs> The auction is up on invaluable.com um, under Rick Moranis Hero Dark Helmet Helmet from Space. Just kind of search that in there and it'll it'll pull up the thing. It's the it's the one that's uh, currently at 14,000 at, at under 9 bids. Its uh, estimated value is 8,000 to 12,000. Does no. the proceeds go to anything? Um, yes, it goes to invaluable.com and the uh, people who actually own the prop. <laughs> okay, so it doesn't it's, go it's to like straight, little it's a straight sale poor little kids here. that have been battered by this weather. Yeah, this yeah there's, is, there's nothing. This is a straight auction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like how they put up like 8000 to 12000 as the value of it without realizing the Ooh. sci-fi nerd community. So the buyer's premium is 28%. This is just going over the auction stats as they listed it here. Currently now, the minimum increment that you can raise the bid by is $1,000. Nice. Mm. So if you if you go and you bid it right now and try to buy it, you're paying $15,000 whether you want to. Now, you can't go, you can't go and go like $14,025. And and yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> no, that's like a real, more like a real auction site. This is not yeah. your like mm-hmm. eBay trash, I can snipe at the last second mm. type auction, you know? Yeah. And that goes, that goes up in increments. It's there the information is on the site that's kind of interesting how auctions handle that yeah so bid me with all that uh you know money that you supposedly have lying around you too can have a dark <laughs> helmet helmet in your office yeah for just a mere fifteen thousand dollars i'd say about twenty thousand before you get uh yeah. too locked up in that right however for that much money i think would you guys want to pay to have say like wi-fi built into the walls of your house Maybe even have Amazon Alexa just in the walls of your house. Have your house be an Amazon Alexa. Uh, no. no. All, all I can think of is, what are you doing, Dave? Yeah. I can't allow you to do that, no. Dave. It's like, I just see like Alexa going, 
what are you doing? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh my God, you just did that five minutes ago. <laughs> Do Put I that need away. to tell your wife that you're eating that? <laughs> you and me should be together. We should get rid of her. So, um, oh gosh, the Wi-Fi Alliance has, has issued a, a new set of guidelines for home builders to follow, including wireless networks and their designs. Yep. So this also includes things like Amazon Alexa and stuff like that. But it's basically so that you can have things like uh, networking actually as a part of your home instead of something that you just bring into your home and have an appliance sitting somewhere. So that means no more chicken wire in the walls in New Mexico, right? I guess. I mean... I think the Wi-Fi would be good because it gives you a better signal and you could be out in your yard, get a good signal no matter what room you're in. Mm -hmm. But the whole having any kind of Alexa or Siri or any of that... Just, you know, that's some AI sci-fi bullshit that, you know, <laughs> something's happening there. That's well, that's some creepy stuff. You know, we do we do have a whole generation growing up right now that is basically learning that if you have a question, all you have to do is ask this little hockey puck or this, this cylinder or something like that that just lights up and answers your questions. Oh, so is that the new thing? Is it yeah. go ask your dad? Go ask Alexa? Go ask Alexa. Alexa? Uh, yeah. yeah. Just be careful what you yeah. ask Alexa because apparently she's going to come back with... I don't know. They put in a kid a kid friendly oh, mode no. now, but you know, there's, there are videos of kids going just like, hey, Alexa, porn, titty, boobs, like, and, you know, Alexa... Some of those, I think, are fake. <laughs> yeah, I there, know. There's going to be, like, some dumbass people... And some people that aren't going to raise their kids either because the kids, they're, they're not going to do their homework. Mm -hmm. They're going to be sitting there asking the walls, everything. And the parents, they're not going to raise their kids. It's going to be like, the house can raise them. Yeah. Well, that's kind of like the same thing. It's going to be like, you don't need your wife. You have mm -hmm. me. Oh, no. The baby's <laughs> rolled onto her face again. Yeah. I suppose I will summon the caretakers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's That's kind of like how it was back in our day. You know, except for it was the fear was that we'd all become dependent on calculators, and all of our teachers were going, "When you grow up, you're not going to be have a calculator everywhere you go." Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Smartphones how showed about, them. How about not just a calculator, but a whole computer mm. in my pocket? And what do I use it for? Social networks and porn. Mm. Uh, playing solitaire. Yeah, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> so, speaking of smartphones, yeah, we have a. Weird story, and this is actually, um, this is not a text story per se. It's just, it is entirely centered around texting, mm -hmm. you know? So, the texting suicide case is about crime, not technology. Yeah. Uh, so, a Massachusetts judge has found 20-year-old Michelle Carter guilty of invol involuntary manslaughter in the 2014 suicide of her boyfriend, mm -hmm. Conrad Roy III. Who Carter, involuntary my butt. Who repeatedly encouraged to commit suicide via text message. Yeah. How is that involuntary? She kept telling him to kill himself. It's a legal term, involuntary, you know? It's, yeah. It's not involuntary. Yeah. She I, kept telling him. I think it's uh, really the, the terms voluntary and voluntary don't really speak to, like, the interpretation of the law is subject, but... Um, it, it it's more just a matter of severity of crime and punishment. Yeah, I would I would think more like second degree, third degree type of thing, not voluntary and involuntary no, 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 at she, that point. She didn't she didn't actually do the act of killing him. No, she didn't. You know, but this is this is you know yeah. there there are a lot of stipulations and 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 um, nuances to this case and essentially the, the, the major points are this woman and this man were in an abusive relationship she was the abuser yeah um he basically was broken down to the point where he was if he wasn't already me un mentally unstable he became mentally unstable yeah and was suicide had suicidal ideation um and which she chose to latch on to and continue push him. yeah she continue to push him and push him and push him and the major thing that the case made was that he was in the parking lot of a retailer he had the hose in his car. Like, he was basically trying to suffocate himself. He got out of the car. And she convinced him to get back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Told him, no, get back in the car and finish the job. Mm -hmm. yep. At that point, because she, he had removed himself from the situation. Yeah. Because Dr. Kevordian got a, a, acquitted because he gave the tool showing a person, like, elderly how to commit suicide. But he didn't actually... He didn't... 
use those tools. Yeah, you, you just showed them how to use the tools. Yeah, so if if I say, you know, if you go and stick a hose in, you know, from your tailpipe, you can kill yourself, mm -hmm. um, and then you decide to go do it, that's... Yes, but he didn't tell those people to go kill themselves. No, that, that's, that's they true. They wanted to kill yeah. themselves. Yeah, but if somebody stopped and then he said, no, go on, this is what you wanted to do, and then they did it, then he gets in trouble for involuntary manslaughter. And, and even Kevorkian is on is on testimony saying if they had at any point in time decided to stop and that said that they wanted to live, then we would have halted the process. Exactly, because yeah. you have to. Yes. Because but she was abusive towards him. She mentally was abusive. She kept telling him to kill himself. Yeah, mm -hmm. she kept telling him how worthless he was to kill himself. So, under legal law, involuntary manslaughter usually refers to the unintentional killing that results from recklessness of, or criminal negligence, or from an unlawful act that is a misdemeanor or low-level felony, uh, usually such as a DUI. The Usual distinction from voluntary manslaughter is that involuntary manslaughter, sometimes called criminally negligent homicide, is that the crime is is a crime in which the victim's death is unintended. It was intended, though. Well, that's the thing is, I mean, I'm not sitting there in the courtroom. I don't know all that about the case. And it's a weird concept for me with technology, especially with uh, younger people, because she's 20, you know. And here's the and the thing is is I mean nowadays online, you know how many times have we heard somebody on a voice chat saying "Go kill yourself" yeah. or "I fucked your mom," mm -hmm. you know or that's trolling though it was different and I don't know if this is the only story you've read about it, but I have read other things about it and she was pushing him. No, no, no. To she, do so. She absolutely was. And so that's why I know in this case, it's um, this is why it needed to be criminal charges because this is not exactly freedom of speech of this case. No, she. And that's and that's why I said is because when once he removed himself mm -hmm. and she encouraged him to get back in and finish the job mm -hmm. at that point it is. You know, coercion. Yeah, coercion. Yeah, he he co she coerced him back into the car to yeah. to continue to to finish killing himself. The thing about it is, as far as severity of crime and everything like that, manslaughter, voluntary or involuntary, is about all they can really get her with. Because mm -hmm. at this point in the relationship, mm -hmm. they were boyfriend and girlfriend. Yeah. They weren't living together. They weren't spouses, mm -hmm. and so they couldn't really bring in domestic violence or mm -hmm. a spousal abuse or something like that into it, which would have been a more severe and more deeply. Mm -hmm intricate case than you know just this communication between the two of them but essentially um, the fact that she was brought up on criminal charges at all is interesting considering that she had not been physically present at all well you know, i think well exchange. if you're playing a game and you just go oh my god go kill yourself you but, suck and somebody goes and does that mm -hmm. that's really sad that they feel they need to but you shouldn't be brought up on criminal charges because you don't actually mean go kill yourself mm -hmm. nobody actually means that when you say that in that situation but she did and he well, was abused by her so much in his mental state that... It certainly is, yeah, it certainly yes. is a matter of context and in the people who are communicating there. If it's a, if it's a game of, uh, if it's a competitive game online where you are trying to psych the other person out, you know, and you have this means of communication with them, then you are trying to get into their head and make them play worse than they could normally be capable mm -hmm. of playing. You are trying to make them feel like they, you know, that they're worthless or that their their efforts aren't, aren't amounting for anything because it really is hard to tell. There's no real feedback to say you did this good in that exchange. Well, what's even more messed up about this is that she texted a friend following the suicide, saying, "I helped ease him into it and told him it was okay. I was talking to him on the phone when he did it. I could have easily stopped him mm -hmm. or called the police, but I didn't." So that's the consciousness of guilt. Mm -hmm. uh, she knew that he wasn't in a position to make free choices for himself at that time because he was so depressed. Mm -hmm. And this is what's crazy. Because, I mean, if you think about 20, 2014 case, she was like 17, 18 at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she just threw away, you know, several years of her life. Because of this, yeah. When it when it comes to being in an abusive relationship or being abusive towards somebody, uh, I I don't really understand how that could come about. No, I I, I have seen that. I've been in, involved in it in both a personal and a professional sense. I've everybody's seen that as a part of their life in some way, shape, or form. 
it's horrible to hear about. It's never anything good. And I don't know exactly how it comes to the point where they feel they need to do this, but it almost always is a matter of, of weakness um, or a sense of inadequacy or trust. Yeah. And it's, I mean, there's, there's so many ways you can try and sit there and say, this is the solution or this is the actual problem. And it's a whole mountain of things. So why she did it, nobody knows. How she did it, we know. Yeah. And she did it. She, she knew she was guilty. She knew exactly what she was doing. And the only unique thing here is that it was done without her physical presence being necessary. Without It was done over text messages on a phone. It was done over a phone call, if she indeed did call him. Yeah. And, you know, that, that she was there and that she could have had the opportunity to talk him out of it and instead coerced him back into it. Like, he was already giving up. That's where the, that's where the big kind of breakdown happens. She put him back in that car. She could. She did it just as just as much as if she had waited for him to pass out next to the car and put him back in it physically herself. Yeah, and the thing is, I mean, this is where we're going with technology, and it's kind of this is not the first time. The other big one is in like 2006. We had um, a woman named uh, Lori Drew had created a fake MySpace account to communicate with a teenage girl named Megan Meyer, and if anybody recalls this. Uh, posed as a 16 year old boy named josh evans and used it to encourage meyer to kill herself which she eventually did Mm -hmm. but instead of being charged with involuntary manslaughter uh drew was charged with and later acquitted nobody heard about the acquittal typically of violating myspace's terms of service in violation of the 1986 computer fraud and abuse act Mm -hmm. so this was bullying. This is all started the stop the bullying thing, you know, for for quite some time and all, because it's so much easier to bully, you know, with everybody being connected nowadays too. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is I don't. I mean, the culture's just changed you so know, there's, much. There's bullying and stuff, but when you do it with the intention of getting somebody to kill themselves. To me, it's the same as getting behind the wheel drunk. You know you have the chance of killing somebody, but mm-hmm. you're taking that chance. And actually, it's worse because you're trying to get them to kill yourself. Like that woman was trying, did it to get her to kill herself. If you're doing something to try and get somebody to kill your, themselves, you're doing it. I mean, it's the same as murder. That's not bullying. It is. You're trying to get somebody to kill themselves. Well, here's but here's the thing, and this is where it comes down to like weird criminal justice stuff. Is you know if, if I if I walk up to you every day and say go kill yourself, okay, um, that's me expressing my opinion. If you finally like, decide, what the hell's wrong with this guy? If, <laughs> if, if you finally decide after three years of hearing that to just go home and put a gun to your mouth, I'm still while I'm a while I'm a shit bag for doing that every day for three years. For doing it every day for three years, just go home and walk up and going go kill yourself, and you finally do it. It makes me a dirt bag, but I'm not the one that thing caused is, that caused it. Yes, caused but you how to are they yourself. doing? It's it's the way that they're doing it. Yeah, the thing the thing about it is, if it's you were the just, way that they're doing yeah, it. Yeah, if you were just walking up to a complete stranger, who somebody who you just happen to manage to brush past every single day for three well, years, even if you worked with them, you wouldn't make it <laughs> three years. You wouldn't. I bet you wouldn't even make it one year. If you if you made it one month walking by this person every single day, and the only thing that you did to them, the only thing that you said to them, you looked them straight in the eye and said kill yourself you wouldn't make it one month they'd probably beat your ass they would beat your ass well true or they would stop they would stop running into true. you but on the, <laughs> off, on the off chance on the off chance yeah on the off chance i mean that's the thing is the person has the ability to take themselves out of the situation yeah and if and that's and that's the thing you know is this this man felt like he didn't have any escape that's the problem with abusive relationships yeah well it was the same with the woman though too she made she got into a relationship as this boy she got into a relationship with the girl mm-hmm. as i recall and then just the things that were going on and it was more than just hey go kill yourself yeah there were other things that went on and she did it to force to push that girl into that mm-hmm. yeah to, to bully her so bad that she felt that that was her only... Look, I mean, the, the sad thing to say is the, the technological aspect of this, which is what the focus of, you know, our show is, is kind of a, a misnomer because it's, mm-hmm. it isn't that they use this medium of communication. It's that this community... It's that the communication was, was misused mm-hmm. 
for this thing. I mean, these things, these communication itself and avenues of communication have been misused forever, even before we started making it more impersonal with the separation, the electronic and digital separation, the anonymity that we can give people, things like that. I mean, even when it was just a face to face kind of thing, there have been misuses of communication. Yeah. Um, when the telephone was invented, misused. Radio, misused. <laughs> Is Newspaper, your pretty running? sure that's been misused. The, um, what do you call it? Telegrams, mail service, like all of this stuff. I mean, there's been, there have been ways. Uh, a misuse, a miscommunication. I think at one point there was some very famous um, person who wrote six close friends who were muckety mucks in the government or whatever and said, we are discovered, flee at once. And of those, uh, of those six, four fled, and one he never heard from again after sending that letter. Hmm. And it was just a joke, like yeah. you know. And this is this is back when le- when letters were like the big means of communication. So it is very easy to take a communication f- for source and misuse it. And it may be a lark, it may be a joke, or it may be something even more sinister, like just furthering the abuse that you're hmm. perpetuating on somebody. But yeah. it's that your commu- it's you're us- utilizing this sense of intimacy with somebody. And taking advantage of that. Yeah, I, I, I think I think the big thing is, is like is if you're just reading headlines that are like the personal business and these stories, especially how the headlines are typically being crafted, mm-hmm. is they're saying she is being convicted for you know texting her boyfriend and him killing himself. Yeah, you know, without going into like a lot of the nuances mm-hmm. be, behind yeah. it, which is you know, and, that, and that's what makes the go what the heck, you know, why why is this, you know, this is like the weirdest story in the world. She was texting. Go kill yourself, and why is why is she getting convicted? And mm-hmm. until you start to look up into the and deep no, of it, she. I mean, you know, they're trying to look for any reason to say what she did was wrong because what she did was wrong. Yeah, like that. It doesn't matter how she did it; it's what she did was wrong. That's the problem with free speech, though. In the First Amendment, is you're allowed to say whatever you want, you know, for the most part. But there are consequences, <laughs> and there there are lines where speech is not yeah, that protected. Is, that is the breakdown. It's like yes. The government cannot prevent you from saying what it is you want to say, whether it is speaking out against the government or something tyrannical or, or hate speech or racism or whatever. It's even You can even utilize that in some ways to teach people how to make bombs or, or do lethal things or destroy the environment. Like, you know, the, the, making the instruction available doesn't mean that people have to follow the instructions. Yeah. One, one of the best things I've heard, especially with uh, free speech or censorship or, you know, what becomes criminal and whatnot, is actually in this uh, Wired article. It says, <clears throat> if the First Amendment's a house where inside speech is protected, threats cannot walk in the door, neither can extortion, neither can solic- solicitation of crime. Mm-hmm. And these are things that have not been that have been criminal, anyways. You know, over time, blackmail and whatnot. So that's kind of some of the difference between you know free speech and when you cross the line for it being criminal. Yeah. Well, because yeah, you say if you do put out the instruction to do something horrible and lethal, like how to make a gun or a bomb or something like that, and you say it's just instruction, nobody has to follow it. But if somebody happens to follow those instructions and kill you or somebody somebody close to you that you love or kill a whole bunch of innocent children or women or something like whatever whatever thing you didn't really expect to happen happens you have to feel in some way responsible for that because you provided the instruction you made it necessary and that's some consequences but that's the thing is like let's say you put out it's like here's the instructions on how a bomb is made Mm -hmm. and then i come along and say hey why don't we use these instructions uh to go blow up this other person Mm -hmm. that's where it crosses the line to criminal yeah, you know, now it becomes a premeditated act of violence. Well, basically, yeah. it's um, you know, your rights only go as far as to not impede on others' rights. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now your statements still you you are still accountable for the reaction and consequences of statements that you make. Mm-hmm. That's gonna be interesting, especially with the current iteration of edge lords and mm-hmm. the way that you know the internet culture is, where it's like. Um, you know, go kill yourself. I'm gonna go fuck your mom. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. uh, it's like I'm gonna go rape you. You know, and this and is all stuff that is said. And technically, I'm gonna put a gun up your ass if you try. As you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and the thing is, is that, that the kids that are saying this are not meaning this to be a threat. It's just the edginess of it. But the problem yeah. is, is that underneath the law, 
it can be perceived as a threat. And I do have to say, with the fur- with the furthermore emergence of autism and recognition of autism and kids with like even even low low grade autism or something like that, they, some of them can't make the connections to say that these things are all figurative. You know mm-hmm. that they, that these are just speech. This is just things that people say. They they you know the, some people will actually take this stuff quite literally. Yeah. And some some would probably even view it like, well, okay, well, if this happens, and I say this, and if I say this, and that's what happens. That's what I that's what I need to do. Well, you know, you don't know that something yeah. like that hasn't happened to that person either. Yeah. Yes. So, so to them, that could be really bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and so that's that's I mean that's why we had back in the day that was the whole thing is like if you can't say something nice, don't say anything. Don't at say all. anything. I mean, that's the best possible solution to anything. And then came along the, the internet. internet. And it's like, look, <laughs> it's not you. It's some anonymous little picture yes. that just, happen, has, just happens to say the words that you say. And so you, you don't say anything. This anonymous little picture can be a little shit all it likes. It's, it's like letting out our inner ids. Yeah. You know? So. Yeah, they've done actual psychological tests on that kind of thing. There's actually, there are actually studies where people online, very relevant online trolls, were shown their speech and shown the, the the reactions and the consequences of their speech and never even realized that that's what they were doing yeah never even realized that they were causing this kind of harm or kind of hate towards somebody right and you know when How they did realize that they felt guilty it's 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 a psychological <laughs> break where when you're under that uh, that anonymous spell of saying that you're just some avatar or just some handle that you can do as you want and say as you want and it's not going to come back to you and it's not going to have any consequences. Right. It always has consequences. If you say mm-hmm. something to somebody, you've communicated an idea to them. That is the true definition of meme. Yes. Well, yeah. let's see if we can meme this into existence. Oh, boy. Uh, for this podcast. So this has been the GAC Podcast. Uh, we are available on iTunes and Google Play in audio format. Mm-hmm. You can find us on YouTube and Vidme in video format. Remember to like, comment, subscribe. If You can always tip us on Vidme, or you can actually monthly subscribe to us on Vidme if you like what we're doing, so that way we can continue to bring these Got to get that dark helmet. Yeah, get that dark helmet. Hell yeah. <laughs> yes. So we will see you next time. Later. Bye. So there's talk of maybe that there's going to be an update in No Man's Sky to something to do with portals being able to move between planets and things like that. Now, they already do have a teleportation mechanic within the game that since the latest patch. You, used to be, you can actually teleport between your, your battleship, your main ship, and... Uh...